Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, the best Gamecocks podcast on the internet. Today is Wednesday, September the 1st, 2021. Today's show, what a Tuesday, as Shane Beamer speaks to the media, folks. Nolan gets the nod at quarterback. Other takeaways as the Gamecocks release their depth chart ahead of kickoff this Saturday against Eastern Illinois, and many, many more tidbits as Shane Beamer speaks to the media and his Tuesday media availability ahead of this weekend season opener. Also, guys, it is Wednesday, and we're talking gambling as I give my best bet for South Carolina, Eastern Illinois, as well as my SEC gambling picks for week one of the 2021 SEC football season. Guys, we got a packed show here on a Wednesday, and it's all brought to you by our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. Guys, Upstate Movers Group, superior moving service. They bring care and attention the companies can't offer because they're just too busy maintaining trucks and profiting off of them instead of focusing on service. Guys, service is what separates Upstate Movers Group from the competition. They're not a trucking company. They're a moving services company, and they're also employee-owned co-op. Their movers are paid twice the industry average, and everyone on the crew is invested in your success. They have dedicated professional crew members, and they also offer black glove service. They offer end-to-end packing services, custom crating and packaging for special items, and cleaning services as well. They're founded by Greenville Natives and University of South Carolina alumni guys, so a Gamecock-owned small business. They also offer 20 years of project management moving experience, and they can offer logistics and solutions that traditional moving companies simply do not have the skills for. Guys, whether in the upstate or across the state of South Carolina, if you have any moving needs in 2021, be sure to check out our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. You can find them on social media at Upstate Movers Group. Or of course, if you have any other questions, go to their website, upstatemoversgroup.com. That's upstatemoversgroup.com. Be sure to check them out and tell them Chris from the Spurs Up show sent you. Let's get it. Boys and girls, happy Wednesday, happy hump day, and happy first day of September. Hope you're all doing well. I'm Chris Phillips, host the Spurs Up show, as always. Appreciate you guys tuning in. We have got a packed show, a lot to get into, a lot to dissect, and a lot to unpack here on a Wednesday as we now just sit three days away from the beginning of the 2021 football season. And guys, also, let me wish you a very happy first day of September. Yes, it is September the 1st. And guys, in the month of September, Gamecocks football is happening. I know we're all excited to see the calendar flip to September. Like I said, just three days away, folks. Again, wherever you are, wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope this finds you well, whether you're on the commute, you're in the office, you're on the job, you got the day off, you're in class, whatever it is you're doing. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'll tell you this, guys. You know, one of my favorite things about what I do and talking Gamecocks specifically, because many people ask me on a day-to-day basis, right? Like, Chris, how do you do daily shows? How do you do a two-hour daily show? And then how do you do daily podcasts? How do you not get burnout? How do you not run out of stuff to talk about? And as I'm sure you all already know, those who are tuned in, but as we all know, the great thing about the University of South Carolina, especially for someone like me who creates content, and does a podcast, truly, it never seems to disappoint in regards to storylines and drama and just pure, unfiltered chaos. And that's what it feels like we had yesterday with Shane Beamer speaking to the media, Zeb Noland officially getting the nod and some other tidbits as well. And, of course, we're going to dive into all of that today. Again, it never disappoints, guys. If you're wondering, it's like, Chris, how do you never run out of stuff to talk about? Every single day, it's something new. 
with the University of South Carolina. But we love it. And, of course, that's where we have to start, right? That's where we're going to start. Zeb Nolan, the big news dropping yesterday. Nolan officially getting the nod as QB1. And I'll say this because as expected, right, as expected, there was a reaction on social media. Some positive, some negative. There was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of people saying, oh, my God, this coaching staff, this is Colin Hill 2.0, this, that, whatever. And I'll say this. For those of you and those of us, I should say, that are very in tune with Gamecocks football and have been paying attention over the last couple of weeks. And by the way, I'm not trying to slam anybody that is a casual fan or isn't quite as in tune. Hey, people have their lives to live. I totally get it. But for those who are in tune with Gamecocks football and what is going on, day-to-day in regards to what coaches are saying and players are saying and the overall momentum in the building and around the program and just the, the, the rumors and the tidbits here and there and everything, we all saw this coming, right? And I want to say this, by the way. Yes, I want to go on record and say I was wrong. I was wrong initially when this first happened. And Zeb Noland, after Luke Doty's injury, was brought onto the roster. I went on record, and you can go back and listen. I'm owning it, by the way, guys. I went on record and said, Zeb Noland will never play a down at the University of South Carolina. I thought he would never see the field. And again, I was just going off of what Shane Beamer said, right? That, hey, we need a quarterback for depth. We need to get guys reps. We only have three quarterbacks on the roster working out right now. You know, he compared the situation to Georgia and Oklahoma, and they had like six or seven guys. So it made sense, right? But as the days and the weeks went by, And we continued to hear things, and we heard rumors, and we heard more rumors, and we heard more momentum behind Zeb Nolan, and we heard more and more and more momentum. It became very clear that this evolved from, oh, what a funny story this is, what a a nice story, a guy who was a GA, he's come back on the field to help out. It went from that to, oh, snap, Zeb Nolan has got a chance to start. And sure enough, yesterday officially named the starting quarterback for South Carolina's first game of the 2021 football season. Again, like I said, if you have been in touch with Gamecocks football and kept up with it day to day like we have, you saw this coming. It it wasn't something that shocked you. It wasn't something that surprised you. And I think most people that tune into this show understand the reasoning. And I want to start there because I want to get into the reaction from people, right? Because there certainly was a reaction, right? There certainly was a reaction. And the reasoning is this. Guys, selfishly for Shane Beamer, this is not only the 2021 season opener for the Gamecocks. This is not only Shane Beamer's debut as South Carolina's head coach. This is his debut as a head coach, period. And so I think what happened, Shane Beamer, Marcus Satterfield, they sat down, they looked around their quarterback room, and they said this. Okay, Luke Doty, who is our undisputed QB1, by the way. Notice that I said Zeb Nolan is the starting quarterback for week one against EIU. He is not QB1. Luke Doty is QB1. Period, point blank, end of discussion. When healthy, Luke Doty is QB1. This is his football team. But he is injured. So I think what Shane Beamer... Marcus Satterfield did. They sat down. They looked around their quarterback room and said, okay, here are our options. We've got Jason Brown, a guy who, you know, I've met Jason, like the guy, glad he's a Gamecock. But Jason Brown transferred in from St. Francis. He's never taken a snap at this level before. So extremely unproven. Then you've got a guy in Colton Gothier, a true freshman, guys, drinking water out of a fire hose. He's trying to adjust to the speed of the game and learn the playbook. And I mean, Colton Gothier's a guy, guys, is a true freshman. He's just trying to make sure he gets the class on time. So is he really ready to play? Probably not. Are we ready to hand him the keys to the car while Luke Doty's out? Probably not. Then you got Connor Jordan, who's a walk-on. No disrespect to walk-ons, but he's a walk-on. And then you have this guy, Zeb Nolan. And again, I agree, guys, the story is absolutely crazy. It's wacky. It's bonkers. It's a story that only could fit with Gamecocks football. No question. But you got this guy in Zeb Nolan, 
that actually played football in the spring at North Dakota State. He also played Power 5 football at Iowa State. And I think they looked around Shane Beamer, Marcus Satterfield, all parties involved, and they said, okay, this is Luke Doty's car. You want to equate it to that, 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 uh, that comparison. This is Luke Doty's car. He's out right now. Who can we hand the keys to that is going to be the steady hand that is going to return it the exact way it was found? Who is that guy? And I think they looked around and said, that guy is Zeb Nolan. Because I know fans want to assume, oh, Jason Brown will ball out, Colton Gothier will ball out. The last thing they want to happen, though, is you hand the keys to those guys and they piss down their leg and the lights are too bright because you don't know how they're going to perform in a power five game. At least with Zeb Noland, you at least feel like he's not going to go out there and the lights be too bright. And he's scared to play in front of 80,000 and, 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 and his heart's racing out his chest and, he, and, he, and his hands are shaking and he don't even know what to do. Because guys, here's the thing. I've said this once and I'll say it again. This has been a really fun storyline to follow, and it has provided someone like me and others with a lot of great, interesting, intriguing banter and content and debate. But guys, it really doesn't matter who started the game. You are 42 and a half point favorites against Eastern Illinois. Many of you listening could go play quarterback Saturday night and beat Eastern Illinois. That is a fact. Whoever's behind center is going to do a lot of handing the football off anyways. But like I said, I think Shane Beamer, Marcus Satterfield, they looked around and said, who can be the steadiest hand for us? Who can make sure that we get off to a good start and we have a successful season opener? Because the last thing Shane Beamer, Satterfield, or this fan base, by the way, wants to happen is... You start a guy like Brown or Gauthier, and I don't want to assume they'd go out there and not play well, but you just don't know. It's just an unknown. But you start a guy like that, and they put the ball on the ground. They make a dumb mistake. They can't get the snap. They're nervous. They they don't remember the plays. I mean, all kinds of things can go wrong with these guys. So I understand why Shane Beamer and Marcus Satterfield are turning the ball to a veteran and a guy who's actually played at the Power 5 level. Now, I want to address the people that I saw on social media saying, oh, this is Colin Hill 2.0, and Beamer's like must champ. He's must champ 2.0. I've lost faith in the coaching staff. Number one, this situation is nothing, nothing like Colin Hill a season ago. And I think this is where, you know, I was speaking earlier, the people that have been in tune with Gamecocks football, people that listen to this show and follow this show. And again, I'd say the majority of you tuning in, you tune into the majority of the shows. So you knew about the Zeb Nolan thing before yesterday. We'll put it that way. But I think a lot of the people with the negative reactions, a lot of the reactions you saw yesterday and you're probably continuing to see on social media, these are people that, again, it's no slight against them, right? It's no slight against them at all, whatever. But they're a little bit more of the casual fan who's not quite as in tune. I, I saw a lot of people comment and say, who the hell is Zeb Nolan? I never even heard of the guy. So there are some people that didn't even know there was a quarterback competition going on or didn't know that Zeb Nolan, a GA, had suited up. They had no idea. So they felt blindsided. But a lot of those people making these comparisons, trying to slam the coaching staff already before they've even played a game, talking about the Colin Hill situation. I mean, are people really that hurt and distraught over what happened a season ago. I'm not going to spend the next 10, 15 minutes talking about it and breaking it down, but I would imagine those same people who are on social media leaving those comments and bitching and moaning about about the Colin Hill 2.0 and, oh, my God, Zeb Nolan, and what is Shane Beamer thinking? I just imagine those guys being at their laptop or being on their phone still wearing their Ryan Holinsky jersey to every single game. Like, guys, I know that's probably where it stems from for many of you. Get the fuck over it. Ryan Alinsky lost his job to Colin Hill. This is nothing like the situation a season ago. Nothing like it. Zeb Noland is filling in while Luke Doty, QB1, is out with a foot sprain. Now, if this was North Carolina, if you were opening with Tennessee, if you were opening with Georgia, gosh, Shane Beamer made it clear he could go if he had to. But what is the point in playing Luke Doty if he's anything less than 110% ready in a game where you're favored by six 
touchdowns. Some of you want to compare it to last year because you're so scarred and you're so butthurt over what happened last year with Ryan Holinsky, your, your, your savior at quarterback. Oh, my God. What, you know, they did Ryan so dirty. You know, they, oh, my God, they messed him up. They, they, they shoot him out of here. No, he lost the job. Colin Hill came in and took his job. Bottom line, point blank, period, end of discussion. If you can't accept that, that's fine, but it's a fact. That's exactly what happened. Ryan Holinsky didn't do what he needed to do to make sure he was the leader the football team needed and the guy in the huddle calling the plays and being the dude out there. That is the bottom line. So stop comparing this situation to last year's situation. Colin Hill came in and won the job as QB1. He won the job as the starting quarterback. He won the job as the leader the entire football team looked to and respected. There's no doubt this is Luke Doty's football team. I think Zeb Nolan understands that. I think Jason Brown understands that. I think Colton Gothier understands that. And I know Shane Beamer's not going to come out, by the way, in his media availability and say, oh, well, there's no competition. The second Luke is back from injury, you know, he's our starting quarterback. They want to promote competition, right? They, they want to promote that. That is healthy for a football team to have competition. But Luke Doty will not lose his starting job because of an injury. I expect him to be back this time next week practicing. And he will start in Greenville against East Carolina because the best version of this offense and this football team is with Luke Doty under center. And you know what? If Shane Beamer didn't believe that, he wouldn't have named the guy QB1 after the spring game. He wouldn't have had him QB1 in the fall. The only reason Zeb Nolan's got a jersey on, guys, is because Luke Doty got hurt, and Shane Beamer looked at his quarterback room and said, oh, crap, I've got guys with no Power 5 experience, or I've got this GA who played in a football game three and a half months ago. And at least, if nothing else, he can give us some stability starting out the game. Guys, they're all going to play. Brown, Gauthier, they're all going to play. It's a name your score, empty the bench type of game, which we'll talk about more in depth tomorrow and Friday. But for the people that are trying to, I mean, listen, a lot of people out there, because yesterday was the two year anniversary of hashtag fire will must champ. And I guess some people got the, the, the idea of me that I'm only going to have vitriol and have, have any type of emotion when, when uh, I, I, I think a coach is a, you know, a, a, just a shit bum and has no clue what he's talking about and I want the coach fired. I'll have the same vitriol in defending Shane Beamer because it's ridiculous. It's, it's absurd to see these people on social media. Like, I'm sorry, your, 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 your knight in shining armor didn't work out, Ryan Holinsky. I'm sorry he did it. But you have got to get over it. Gamecock fans right now are like people who are in a relationship. They get cheated on. They get abused. They get, you know, whatever. You know, they, they have a bad relationship, and they move on from the relationship, and they date somebody new, but they still hold on to the past grudges and the past emotions, and they project that on the new person. That's kind of what Gamecock fans are right now. And I understand the scar tissue is very deep. Gamecock fans have a lot of trauma and a lot of PTSD from the previous staff and the previous regime. But guys, Shane Beamer deserves the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise. If Zeb Nolan goes out there and looks completely incompetent, then this time next week, we can question the decision and say, what the hell are we thinking playing Zeb Nolan? We can do that. But right now, like if you think about it critically, and saying that this is Colin Hill 2.0, that is not thinking critically. That is a lazy take. That is a very, because I'll tell you this, I'll be totally honest. I don't like Mike Bobo, guys. I'm not a Mike Bobo fan. And you all know how I feel about Will Muschamp. But to say that, and again, this is, this is like a whole different topic for a whole different episode, because I never really did dive into this because it was something very, very tricky to dance around and talk about. But a, a, saying that Colin Hill was given the job over Ryan Holinsky because they didn't like him or whatever that narrative is, that's a lazy take. That is a very, very, very lazy take. And again, there's a harsh reality that many of you don't want to come to accept. This situation this year is nothing like last year. Your situation last year, you had a guy who was your starter who allowed a whatever that he was, fifth or sixth year, whatever, three ACL surgery, veteran quarterback to come in and snatch his job away. That is the reality. You can either accept that. You can cry in your, your Ryan Holinsky jersey if you want. You can pitch a fit. 
You can throw your phone down. You can block me on social media. You can tweet at me. You can comment. I do not care. That is the reality. That's the reality. And again, I look at the people commenting on social media trying to slam Beamer for this. It's like, those are the people that must still have their Helensky jersey hanging up in their closet. They must still be, they must still be rocking their Helensky jersey to games. And anytime you try to have a conversation with them about Carolina football at all, they start with, oh man, if Ryan Helensky, only, if only he was still our quarterback, if only he was still on the roster. You know what? If Ryan Helensky was still on our roster, his ass would be sitting right next to Jason Brown and Colton Gothier on the bench. That is a fact. All right, enough about Colin Hill and Ryan Helensky. Anyways, naming Zeb Nolan QB1, I like the decision. If you think about it critically, I totally understand it. Again, selfishly, you're Shane Beamer. This is your debut as a head coach. You want it to go as smoothly as possible. You do. Who's going to give you the best chance to make that happen? Again, he said it yesterday in his media, in his presser. Marcus Satterfield said it before. They're not asking Zeb Nolan to go win the Heisman. They're not asking Zeb Nolan to go be all conference. Guys, over under 20. And you're like, Chris, what are you talking about? Over under 20 passes. The Gamecocks throw Saturday against EIU. So what does it matter who starts at quarterback? It really doesn't. All this is about is, hey, Zeb, you take the keys to the car. Don't wreck it. Bring it back in the condition you found it. For Luke Doty, when he gets back next week to take over the reins and drive the puppy up to East Carolina when we take on the Pirates. That's all this is. So, again, for those of you who have been following along for weeks, you saw this coming. You, you knew this was happening. And I think most of you, and I think the, the, the fans and listeners of the Spurs Up show, you guys are very, very smart. You are not uneducated people. You are very, very smart. And I think you all grasp, for the most part, why this is happening. Again. I just thought it was the, the reaction was hilarious. I mean, some people, oh my God, the, the transfer portal, Jason Brown and Colton Gothier, they're going to enter the transfer portal. Like, are you kidding me? Are you joking? Really? I mean, is that what the point that we've gotten to now is, is guys are just going to enter the transfer portal. They, they don't win the job. Hey, you're a true freshman. Don't win the starting job. Boom. You're in the transfer portal. Come on, man. Come on. And I mean, just to be honest with you, where's Jason Brown going to go, dude? Where's Colton Gothier as a true freshman going to go? Like, let's everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Ooh, that felt good. <sighs> okay, take a deep breath. Let's all relax. It's going to be okay. South Carolina is a six-touchdown favorite. I know it's a wacky story. I know it's crazy. But I really believe, guys, this is one of those things that is going to be a footnote in the 2021 season. Again, it's made for – a really fun and interesting storyline throughout fall camp. It's the quarterback competition and the quarterback battle that none of us asked for. And I partly blame myself because I think I jinxed it because I said during the preseason, hey, man, I'm really enjoying not having to talk about some form, you know, fabricated quarterback battle between Doty and Brown and Gauthier, you know, Luke Doty's QB1 in a discussion, whatever. And then, of course, all hell broke loose. So is it a wacky story? Yes. Is it? Is it just something that could only happen to Carolina football? Yes. But, again, I think at the end of the season, this is going to be a footnote. Zeb Nolan has Power 5 experience. When you think about it critically, it makes sense. And like I said, guys, this is a name-your-score game. It's an empty-the-bench type of game. Not trying to spoil my prediction early, but nobody – I mean, I'm seeing some predictions like 34-17, to 17, guys. This is a name-your-score game for South Carolina. And I know there's a lot of old school Gamecock fans out there like, oh, Chris, you ever seen us in a season opener? We're the Gamecocks. We're supposed to suck. We're supposed to be terrible. Guys, I'm telling you right now, this team South Carolina is playing on Saturday is one of the worst, maybe the worst, South Carolina has played in the last 20 years. Okay? Does not matter who the quarterback is. So, again, Zeb Nolan gives you power five experience. He's had success at that level. He was playing on the field for North Dakota State just a few months ago. And guys, lastly, lastly, not to go back to the hill Holinsky situation, how it's nothing like that, by the way, but as tough as I was on Will Muschamp and as tough as I was on Bobo, but specifically Muschamp, the one thing I didn't agree with 
was that quarterback situation last year and people trying to insinuate that coaches who are paid millions of dollars and coach for their livelihood are playing favorites. Guys, these coaches are coaching for their livelihood, okay? They're coaching for their livelihood. Shane Beamer, Marcus Satterfield, that entire offensive staff, hey, the defensive staff as well. There is not a situation. I'm not saying there aren't some politics in sports, but the best player will play. And I just refuse to believe that Shane Beamer and Satterfield, they sat down and said, well, we just like Zeb more than everybody else. No, they're playing Zeb because they sat down and came to a conclusion from what he showed them in practice and commanding the offense that he gives them the best chance to win. Bottom line, and for those of you asking, well, Chris, what does this say about our quarterback room? What does this say about our depth at quarterback? We must be terrible. Guys, again, it all comes back to the experience and this being your season opener, your debut. Shane Beamer's debut as a head coach. He wants to make a good impression because first impressions are very, very important. He wants to make a good impression. You think Shane Beamer doesn't want to give the Gamecocks what they, Gamecock fans, excuse me, what they want? You think he doesn't want to give Carolina a 70 to 7 win? You think he doesn't want to have a huge blowout win? It'd be 35 0 at halftime? Yeah, I would think so, probably. I think he wants it to be like a celebration of a new era, a very, very fun night at Willie B. And so Zeb Nolan, with the experience, gives you the best opportunity. Again, all he's going to have to do is be the steady hand and lead the offense. And he has experience doing so at the Power 5 level. So I got no issues with it. This is a one-game thing. Luke Doty will be back as far as we can tell next week to resume his spot as QB1. And for those asking, I know what the next question is. Chris, well, what if Zeb Nolan goes and balls out? Do you, do you leave him in there until you lose? Is there a comp? I know what Shane Beamer has to say in regards to there being a competition and all that jazz. But, guys, again, Luke Doty is QB1. He is the leader of this football team. He was named QB1 after the spring game for a reason. But either way, hey, either way, I'll say this too. I'm rolling with Beamer. I don't have a preference of who QB1 is. If Shane Beamer says Zeb Nolan is the best option, then guess what? I'm rolling with Zeb Nolan. If he says Luke, I'll say Luke. If he says Jason Brown, I'm rolling with Jason Brown. Shane Beamer deserves the benefit of the doubt until proven different. Like, holding your past grudges from what Will Muschamp did and trying to project that on a Beamer is complete bullshit. Leave it in the past. I understand what happened, but leave it in the past. It, it should not be projected Shane Beamer's way. Shane Beamer's not exempt from criticism. He's not exempt from if he makes a boneheaded decision, we can criticize. We can critique. That's the beauty of what I do, getting to sit here behind this mic and make content and being independent. I can say whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. But my God, innocent till proven guilty. Let the man coach. Let's see this thing play out before people try to rip him for the decisions he's making. So again, Zeb Nolan, QB1, I think he gives you the steady hand. I would expect Zeb Nolan to play well. How well will he play? Again, guys, he's not going to have to do a lot. If you watched any of EIU over the weekend, South Carolina is going to push them around. Yes, I'd like to see the pass game in some capacity to get guys, your wide receivers, some experience, some confidence more than anything, but it is going to be a very, very run-heavy game in my mind. You might have a couple of guys go over 100 yards, and that's not an over-exaggeration. I mean, South Carolina is going to bully EIU at the point of attack. And again, we'll get more into that on tomorrow's show and Friday as we break down the Panthers and we break down the game and we talk more about that going into Saturday. All right, other things Shane Beamer talked about, because believe it or not, there were other things outside of the quarterback. Uh, Rick Sandage will be out. No surprise there, that leg injury. I'd imagine he's probably going to miss the first couple of weeks. Um, some great news on the injury front, by the, by the way. Kevin Harris and Cam Smith, both good to go, which – I'll be honest with you guys, from what I heard early in camp, I thought Cam Smith was probably going to miss the first couple of games. Didn't think he'd probably be ready until Georgia. So great to hear that he has healed up. Kevin Harris, you know, obviously dealing with his back procedure. The fact that he's going to be ready to go is great. And then, of course, the depth chart was actually before that, before that, another major tidbit from Shane Beamer's media availability. 
the uniforms. How about the uniform message? White, Garnet White will be the uniform this weekend, but Shane Beamer was very clear. He is not into the hoopla. He is not in the hype when it comes to the uniforms. Justin King put out a statement on Twitter in regards to maybe they'll do battle armor, maybe they won't, but Shane Beamer made it very clear. I think he's going to take a much more traditional approach when it comes to uniforms, and you guys have heard me say it. I am so happy for that. White, Garnet, White, base uniform, default uniform at home. White, 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 default on the road. Have yourself a couple alternates. Have big game Garnet. But the days of doing these crazy, wacky, ridiculous uniform combos and letting the players just pick the most absurd combinations, I'm glad those days are behind us. I'm glad those days are over. So, again, white, Garnet, white. Will there be some video later in the week? I have no idea. We've actually got a graphic we're going to post later in the week, a really cool, like, uniform graphic, whatever. But – I'm really glad that, you know, Shane Beamer said, you know what? That's not our focus. We're more concerned with how we play, not how we look. Love that. Absolutely love that from Shane Beamer. He's the same guy he's been since the day he got hired till now. The man's a damn leader, and I love to hear him say that. All right, let's talk about the depth chart a little bit, because that came out, of course. That's how we found out Zeb Nolan was QB1. And just a couple of major takeaways, at least from me, uh, from the depth chart. First, you look at wide receiver, and that's the thing I wanted to hear more about from the coaches and, you know, even the call-in shows, and nobody had really asked about it, but... As we had been hearing through fall camp, Jalen Brooks, Josh Van, and DeCarion Joyner, your three starting wide receivers, with your second three being Xavier Leggett, Amarian Brown, and Jerkari Caldwell or Ortre Smith. Um, you know, you've got some good size there. I mean, you got Jerkari at six foot five, Ortre at six foot four. Um, my question is this because, hey, now we know who the starting three are with Brooks, Joyner, and Van. Which one of those guys is most likely to step up and be wide receiver one? Um, because all three have upside and all three have major questions. I mean, we're talking about Jalen Brooks, who has incredible speed as far as we know. Josh Van, extremely highly touted prospect at a high school. And Dak Joyner, I think he's got an undeniable skill set. His athleticism, um, his quickness, his agility, certainly it stands out to you. But all three have question marks. Josh Brown, or excuse me, Josh Brown. Ja, Jalen Brooks, Jalen Brooks, D2 transfer. Josh Fan hadn't done a damn thing, can't catch a cold since he got on campus. And Dak Joyner, they can't figure out what position he should be at. So is one of these guys ready to emerge as the number one? I still kind of feel like Amarian Brown's going to play a major, major role. You know, we're talking about a guy that missed a lot of fall camp due to COVID, and I think that certainly set him back a bit. But I got to think Amarian Brown's going to play a major role. The most proven receiver in regards to production at the Power 5 level. Um, then you have Jakari Caldwell, which is a very pleasant surprise. A guy I don't think any of us, I didn't really hear about him in fall camp at all, but Jakari Cal Caldwell, again, from Rock Hill, South Carolina, six foot five, 200. Could he be that next big-bodied guy for you, dependable big body guy on the outside? And then Ortre Smith. A, a lot of you ask about Ortre Smith, guys. I'll just keep it short and sweet. I told you I had sold my stock on Ortre. I'd love to see him emerge and become a guy for you, but until he can prove to me he can be healthy on a consistent basis, it's just it's just hard for me, and it's something I'm not going to do. I'm not going to invest stock in that type of guy. I need to see him healthy first. But again, a lot of guys got to find some dudes. Who's going to be that dude out of those first three? Brooks Van Joyner. Who's going to be the dude that steps up and sort of emerges as that playmaker on the outside? Something else that stood out. Um, no starting running back. You got Laquandre White or Marshawn Lloyd or Juju McDowell or Kevin Harris. And, you know, some people freaked out about that. I, I think the only reason, guys, is this. You know, Kevin's coming off the back procedure. They're all going to play. I, I, it doesn't matter. They're all going to play. Listen, I think fans are much more interested and care a lot more about what the depth chart says than even Shane Beamer and the coaches do. They're going to put different guys in there for different packages and different situations. They are all going to see the field. It, it, it's not an indictment or a slight on – it's not an indictment or a slight on Marshawn Lloyd, on Kevin Harris, on any of those guys. They are all going to play. So, but no starting running back name. Uh, EJ Jenkins officially listed as tight end, the backup tight end behind uh, Nick Muse, which I'm not surprised there. You know, I think they're going to split out EJ wide in some different situations, but I think certainly he does play more as a tight end at six foot seven. Uh, defensively, Jordan Birch behind Aaron Sterling, which I think they gave Sterling a nod just simply because he is a senior. Jordan Birch is going to play a lot, guys. Jordan Birch is going to be a major, major, major part uh, of this defense this season. Uh, Jordan Strawn backing up J.J. and Igbari at the buck. That seems to be a really, really strong position. 
the nickel, guys, and the secondary as a whole. That's where things really start to get scary for me. At the nickel, you have David Spaulding and Carlin Splatel. Not saying those guys can't be good players, but we're talking about David Spaulding coming from Georgia Southern and Carlin Splatel coming from Assumption. I mean, who's ready to step up and play some big-time ball in the SEC level? You got Marcellus Dial at one corner. You got Darius Rush or Cam Smith at the other corner, exactly as we predicted. Uh, Jalen Dickerson, good to see Jalen Dickerson starting. R.J. Roderick, Demar Brown, Jalen Foster at the other safety spot with Tyrese Ross behind him. Overall, guys, we talked about secondary on Monday. What you see is what you get. Not a lot of depth. It's going to be a tough year for them, most likely. You just have a lot of guys that are going to have to step up and play to another level that we have not seen yet. Uh, Debo Williams, that was another takeaway for me. Debo Williams down the depth chart. Sherrod Green listed as the starting middle linebacker. Uh, Behind him, Damani Staley or Debo Williams. You know, a lot of people just assume that Debo Williams would step in and be the starter. Um, You know, again, guys, like I told you, coming from Delaware to the SEC, adjusting to this level, it's it's not just, you know, it's Delaware's not the SEC. Neither is St. Francis, neither is Assumption, neither is Georgia Southern. So it doesn't totally shock me that he's down there. But again, I do think Debo Williams will play a lot for you on the weak side linebacker, Brad Johnson, and behind him, Mo Caba or Daryl Ware. Um, feel pretty good about those two guys, especially Brad Johnson. I think as a senior, he is poised to have his best year as a Gamecock. And then finally, in special teams, to carry on Joyner and Juju McDowell listed as your kickoff returners. We've heard a lot about Juju McDowell. You know, he's probably been the guy that nobody's been able to stop talking about. And then your punt returner, Josh Van. The lead punt returner, he will be the guy. I, I can see that. 5'11", 190, he, he's got athleticism. There's no question. Uh, then Amarian Brown behind him, which if you've been watching any of our NCAA simulations, if that means anything to you, Amarian Brown's been pretty incredible in the return game. But no, Josh Van, it looks like he's going to be your main punt returner. So I, I tell you this, as long as he can catch the football and he's dependable back there, that's the starting point. Anything he gives us beyond that is great. And you got to think with Shane Beamer and Pete Limbo, special teams is going to be better. But the big thing is this, South Carolina is a football team. They can't afford mishaps in the special teams in the return game and the kicking game anything of the sort so josh van at punt returner you just hope he can be a solid option back there but again overall not too many crazy you know crazy big surprises in regards to the depth chart but definitely some interesting tidbits um when you took a look at that so again that's it for Shane Beamer, the depth chart, all that good stuff. I'm sure there'll be more updates as we get closer and closer to kickoff again now, just three days away. But man, what, what an eventful Tuesday it was, man. I mean, just pure chaos amongst the fan base and people, but we love it, man. It means kickoff is close. And you know how else you know kickoff is close? When we start talking gambling, that's how you know kickoff is close. And that's what we're doing here on a Wednesday, folks. For the third consecutive season, yes, gambling picks are back. Every single Wednesday, I'll talk best bet for the South Carolina game that weekend, which I will go through, give my best bet, whether it's spread, whether it's over-under, for the Gamecocks game, as well as SEC gambling picks for each and every SEC game. I'll list the spread, I'll list the over-under, and I'll give you guys my best pick for the game, and we're going to track it all season Long. So first things first, let's talk best bet for South Carolina, Eastern Illinois. And you're probably saying to yourself, Chris, what are you talking about? There's no spread in this game. Aha, we found a spread on oddsshark.com, believe it or not. Oddsshark.com has the Gamecocks listed as a 42 and a half point favorite, as you probably heard me say earlier. 42 and a half. Now, there is no over under. Okay, there is no over under, but the Gamecocks are a 42 and a half point favorite. So what's the best bet? Are you laying the 42 and a half with South Carolina, a six touchdown favorite? Or are you taking the Panthers? Are they going to play the Gamecocks a little bit tougher than people expect? Guys, this would be a no play for me. Like in real life, I can tell you right now, I'm not betting on it. This would be a no play. Okay, but if I got to pick one side or the other, I know it sounds crazy because South Carolina, the struggles they've had over the last couple seasons, and again, there's many Gamecock fans out there that say, oh, my God, Chris, we've been so bad in season openers and this, that, blah, 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 whatever. Guys, I'm telling you, if you watched five minutes of EIU's game of the weekend, you would agree with me. The only play in this game is to lay the points with South Carolina. I don't give a damn who's playing quarterback. I I don't give a damn what time the game is, what jerseys we're wearing. Shane Beamer's debut 
at night at williams Bryce Stadium, Eastern Illinois, South Carolina will shove EIU all over the field. Like I told you guys, it's a name-your-score game, and I hate to spoil my prediction for Friday, but you guys know I'm picking the Gamecocks to win, but it is truly a name-your-score, empty-the-bench type of game. So really all you're asking yourself is this, because the starters, they're going to have a field day against EIU. There's no question. Do you feel confident in two things happening? Number one, Shane Beamer keeping his foot on the gas pedal. Number two, the backups being able to come in and play well and actually have success. If you feel good about those two things, Gamecocks minus 42 and a half is the play, and that's the play that I'm going to suggest. That's the play that I'm going to roll with. Gamecocks minus 42 and a half. Yes, minus 42 and a half is the best bet for the game this weekend when the Gamecocks take on EIU. I just don't see a way you can go into a game like this and hold the ticket with plus 42 and a half and just be hoping and praying that the Panthers somehow hold on for dear life. EIU might not score, guys. I mean, literally, they might not score. And I don't know how they're going to stop South Carolina. So the only play in this one, if you're going to play it, again, it'd be a no play for me. Gamecocks minus 42 and a half. That is the play in this one. All right, let's move into SEC gambling picks, guys. Very excited for these return SEC gambling picks week one. Like I said, we'll be keeping track of these as well, by the way. So I'd love for you to lock in your picks. We'll compare each week. Um, if we had a way to kind of track it and we had a leaderboard and see who's leading, I don't really have that capability right now, though. But if we did, I would love to do it, but I'd love to hear from you all how you do. Be honest with me now, how you do. Let's all make our picks together. I'll give you your picks. You give me, or I'll give you my picks. You give me your picks. We'll compare. And by the way, very excited to announce this, guys. Our SEC gambling picks. We've got a new partner for the 2021 football season. I'll be giving these picks on social media. These are actually picks I'm locking in and I'm playing. I've already got a few for Thursday night, by the way. And so the SEC gambling picks this year, guys, they're presented to you by our friends over at Prize Picks, the Prize Picks app and website. Guys, very, very excited. These guys contacted me in the preseason a couple of weeks to kick off. They said, Hey, Chris, we've got this idea for Prize Picks. They said, You ever gamble before? I said, Yeah. They said, Have you ever done fantasy props or any type of props, if you will, any type of prop pick them where you're picking the over under on yards passing or yards rushing or touchdowns. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely familiar with prop picks. I was like, I'm definitely familiar with props, but you never see that for college games. You never see that for college players. They're like, now you do. That's exactly what prize picks specializes in. They're the simplest fantasy game on the market focused around prop total entries. Guys, it's so simple. And like I said, it's so cool because we all watch the Gamecocks, right? We're watching college football, right? We're big college fans. You can also do it with NFL. We're big college fans. What you do is you pick two to five players, and you can win up to 10 times what you put down on any entry. Prize Picks has no sharks, optimizers, or mass multi-entry guys. It's just you versus the projection. Prize Picks allows mixed sport entries as well. So, again, like I said, if you want to take the over on Luke Doty rushing yards – and the under on Patrick Mahomes passing yards. You can do that. It doesn't just have to be college. It can be college. It can be NFL. It can be NBA, multi-sports, multi-leagues, everything. Prize Picks has a slick, easy-to-use mobile app, both on the App Store and Google Play. They're a 4.8 star rated in the App Store with rave reviews. Guys, all of my users who sign up today with the promo code TSUS, with your sign-up code, I should say, not the, not the promo code, but it's a sign-up code. When you download the app or you go to the website and create an account, use that code TSUS, you're going to receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. So if you go put in 100 bucks, you use TSUS, guess what? They're going to match it, 100 bucks, right in your pocket, right 100 free play. And who doesn't love a good free play? Again, lies. like I said, you can go bet on the line. You can go bet on the spread. You can go bet on the over-under. But why not spice things up this football season with our friends over at Prize Picks on the app and the website and get your prop plays in today? I'll be playing mine each and every single week, guys. I'll tell you right now what I have. Right now, I just have the Thursday games. They don't release the weekend totals until after the Thursday games, or I think on Thursdays. But these are my picks for the Thursday games. I'll tell you guys this. I've got three players. Jaden Daniels, the Arizona State quarterback, I've got him over one and a half passing touchdowns. I got Jalen Hyatt, the Tennessee wide receiver. We all know who Jalen Hyatt is. I've got him over 
55 and a half receiving yards. I think he's going to have a big game against Bowling Green. And then Holton Aylers, who Gamecocks are actually playing next week for East Carolina. I have him under 238 and a half passing yards against Appalachian State. I think that'll be a tough game for them. So I've got those three. I've got a $25 bet placed on it. If I win, we win like 60 bucks. So again, guys, it's a really easy thing. And you don't have to win them all, by the way. If you do a flex play, you can just get two of the three right and you win money, guys. It's so easy. It's so simple. So again, our friends over at Prize Picks, go download the app, go to their website, sign up today, use the code TSUS at sign up and get your 100% instant deposit match up to $100. All right, without further ado, let's talk SEC gambling picks. We'll roll through these guys. We'll first start in Knoxville Thursday night, Tennessee against Bowling Green as the Josh Heupel era gets underway. The Bulls are minus 35 and a half over under 61. Listen, I understand Bowling Green is outmatched. They're mismatched. It, it, it's, it's Tennessee is still an SEC school. They're still a power five big time team but they're not going to beat Bowling Green by more than five touchdowns. Give me Bowling Green plus 35 and a half. I could see the Bulls winning this game by 31, 35. I don't see any more than that. Bowling Green plus 35 and a half. Kentucky, UL Moreau. Kentucky, a 30 and a half point favorite. Over under set at 54 and a half, guys. On the flip side, I think Kentucky with Will Levi's, I think they're much improved at quarterback, especially in the passing game. They've got Chris Rodriguez. They've got a dominant defense. This will be a fun one for the Cats. I think they blow out. UL Monroe, Kentucky, hammer them, minus 30 and a half. Arkansas against Rice. Arkansas, a 19-point favorite, over and set at 51. Guys, I'm high on Arkansas. I like Sam Pittman. I like what he's doing there in Fayetteville. Give me the Hogs, minus 19. Woo pig. All right, Bama, Miami. Bama, minus 18, over and set at 61 and a half. And, and a lot of people have gone back and forth on this one with, oh, it's going to be a blowout. Miami stands no chance. A lot of new pieces for Alabama. A lot of new pieces offensively. I'm not taking the Canes plus 18, but what I do feel confident, I trust that Bama defense. I think they will smother the Canes. I don't know that Bama's clicking on all cylinders week one offensively, but man, that under 61 and a half feels really, really friendly. Give me the under 61 and a half when the Canes take on the Crimson Tide. All right, Mississippi State, Louisiana Tech. The Bulldogs are a 23-and-a-half point favorite. Over, under, set at 52-and-a-half. Guys, I think Mississippi State might be the worst team in the SEC outside of Vanderbilt. Give me La Tech, plus 23-and-a-half. Very proud program there. La Tech, plus 23-and-a-half. Missouri against Central Michigan. This one's an intriguing line. Mizzou's just a 14-and-a-half point favorite. Over, under, set at 60-and-a-half. I don't understand this one. This one scares me because it feels too easy. I think Mizzou's an eight-win team this year. I think they take care of business against the Chippewas. Give me the Tigers minus 14 and a half. Auburn Akron. Auburn is 36 and a half point favor. Over and a set at 54 and a half. Auburn's a very interesting team with Harson, Bo Nix. What are they offensively? Tank Bigsby. I think Tank will run wild. I like the over in this one. I think Akron can score a little bit. I like the over. Give me the over the total, 54 and a half. Arguably the game of the season taking place in Charlotte. Georgia, Clemson. Clemson, a three and a half point favorite. Over and a set at 50 and a half. Guys, if you've listened to me for any bit of time, you know, I think the dogs win this game straight up. I've got Georgia plus three and a half. That is free money. If you want to be even more bold, take the dogs and the money line. Florida FAU, the Gators are a 23 and a half point favorite over and a set of 52 and a half. I understand Florida lost generational talent. I understand they lost a ton of pieces from a season ago. And they may get exposed at some point because of that, but it will not be week one. Florida is going to destroy FAU. Give me Florida, the minus 23 and a half, lay the points, hammer it. A&M against Kent State, A&M minus 28 and a half, over under 67. Name your score type of game. A&M will run wild. They want to make a statement week one. A&M minus 28 and a half, easy money. Vandy against East Tennessee State. Vandy minus 21 and a half in this game. Guys, I... I just can't take Vanderbilt to cover a three-touchdown spread. Give me East Tennessee State. I don't know a damn thing about ETSU. This is the one pick where I'm like, I just have genuinely no idea, but there's just no way I can pick Vanderbilt to win a game by more than three touchdowns. Give me ETSU plus 21 and a half. All right, here's an interesting game. LSU at UCLA. Sneaky one of the best games of the first weekend. LSU minus three and a half. Over under set at 65 and a half. Guys, I think UCLA is going to beat LSU straight up. I do. I really, really do. I think UCLA is for real. They've got a game changer at quarterback, and I'm still just not sold on LSU. Man, a lot of questions on the offensive line. Give me the Bruins. And LSU's got to go out west. Give me the Bruins, man. UCLA plus three and a half. I think that's a great pick. Lastly, Ole Miss against 
Louisville, Ole Miss minus 10 and a half, over under set at 75 and a half. Guys, Lane Kiffin's going to score and then score and then score and then score and then score again. I like the Rebels minus 10 and a half. The over is also a great play. If you want to parlay Ole Miss and the over, I think that's good. But in this one, hey, free money, Ole Miss minus 10 and a half. I think that's a no brainer. So again, guys, that's my SEC gambling picks. For week one, accompanied with the best bet for South Carolina EIU. Again, Gamecocks minus 42 and a half. My best bet for Saturday's game at williams Bryce. And like I said, guys, prize picks. Go check out prize picks. Download the app. Go to the website. Use promo code TSUS. When you do, you get 100% deposit bonus match up to $100. SEC gambling picks, guys. We will track those each and every single week. Make your picks. Let's compare as we go week to week to week. And again, guys, I cannot wait to see your picks and follow along and hopefully win you guys a lot of money. But again, guys, that's going to do it for me. Appreciate you all tuning in. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. We will talk to you tomorrow.